Okay, the April 10th, 2018 meeting of the Monroe County Legislature will now come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Alcoffer? Mr. Ancello? Here. Mr. Broth? Here. Ms. Boyce? Here. Mr. Brew? Here. President Carbone? Here. Mrs. Conley is excused. Mr. Delahanty? Here. Mrs. DeFlorio? Here. Mrs. Draw? Mr. Felder? Here. Mr. Flagler Mitchell? Here. Ms. Harris? Here. Mr. Hebert? Here. Mr. Howland? Here. Ms. Cayley is excused. Mr. Lightfoot? Here. Mr. Mofucci? Here. Mr. Marinetti? Here. Mr. Michike? Here. Mr. Morelli? Mr. Moyo? Here. Mr. Rocco? Here. Mr. Shepard? Here. Ms. Taylor? Here. Mr. Turp? Mr. Wilcox? Here. Mr. Wilt? Here. Mr. Zale? Here. Mrs. Draw? Here. Okay, please stay seated. I'd like to introduce Rabbi Drora Settle of Temple Emmanuel L., who has been invited by Legislator Justin Wilcox to lead us in a moment of prayer. I'm truly honored that you've invited me here this evening. But I feel I must use this opportunity to explain why I wish you hadn't. I grew up learning that the United States Constitution guarantees the separation of religion and state in two ways. First, that religious belief and practice should be as free as possible in the private sphere, but with the crucial second condition that no religious practice should be established in the public arena. Over the past decades, this second condition has been eroded by court findings that public prayer is acceptable. In fact, you probably all know it was a local case from Greece that brought the Supreme Court to rule in favor of denominational prayer before meetings. But just because something is legal does not mean it is the right thing to do. The power of our nation's motto, e pluribus unum, comes from an understanding that our common American values of democracy, freedom, and equality are what bring us together. Public spaces and events should be occasions on which we experience that unity. Denominational prayer has the opposite effect, excluding those, often the minority, who cannot participate. Every four years, I experience that exclusion most painfully when the presidential inauguration, an event at the heart of our civic tradition, ends with a Christian prayer, making it clear that I am not considered part of the America being celebrated. My hope is that your desire for an invocation has to do with taking seriously the work of governance. While I feel strongly about the separation of religion and state, I certainly endorse reflection and state. Relevant wisdom from both religious and secular traditions are appropriate. In that spirit, I'd like to conclude with a brief reflection rooted in my own Jewish tradition. Last week, Jews throughout the world observed the festival of Passover, celebrating our freedom from enslavement. The tradition teaches us that this is an ongoing process. In every generation, we must see ourselves as going forth from confinement, from the places and perspectives that constrict us to a place of openness. And repeatedly we are told to have compassion for the stranger, for we ourselves were strangers in the land of Egypt. Openness to others is inextricably linked to our own freedom. This lesson seems all the more urgent at a time in our country when difference has become division. I hope that the work you do together this evening and in the future reflects such a commitment to care and concern for the other, to an increased openness of mind and spirit, so that our community may be one of inclusion for all its members. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. Thank you. Well, I'll see you in okay. okay, before Legislator Mafucci leads us in the Pledge of Allegiance, I'd like to acknowledge our former minority leader, Carrie Andrews. Thanks for coming back. We missed you. Thank you. Please stand as Legislator Mafucci will now lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag.
this time I ask that you remain standing without objection. We will take agenda item number 24 out of the regular agenda order. Agenda item number 24 is moved by Legislator Marionetti and seconded by Legislator Lightfoot. Will the clerk please read the resolution in memoriam for former Monroe County Legislator and Congresswoman Louise Slaughter. Expressing regret of the Monroe County Legislature on the recent passing of former Monroe County Legislator and Congresswoman Louise Slaughter. Be it resolved that the Monroe County Legislature hereby expresses its deepest sympathy at the recent passing of former Monroe County Legislator and Congresswoman Louise Slaughter. And whereas Congresswoman Slaughter passed away on March 16, 2018 at the age of 88. And whereas Congresswoman Slaughter was born August 14, 1929 in Harlan County, Kentucky. She graduated from the University of Kentucky with a Bachelor's of Science in Microbiology and a Master's Degree in Public Health. After marrying her husband, Bob Slaughter, she moved to Western New York and lived most of her life in Fairport. And whereas Congresswoman Slaughter first entered politics in the early 1970s, she was elected to the Monroe County Legislature in 1976, where she served until 1978. She served as regional coordinator for Mario Cuomo while he served as Secretary of State from 1976 to 1978 and while he served as Lieutenant Governor from 1979 to 1982. Louise served in the New York State Assembly from 1982 until 1986. In November of 1986, she was elected to the United States House of Representatives and served for 15 terms. She was a true advocate for the community and was recognized for securing federal funding for infrastructure projects and helping well-known business come to Monroe County. And whereas Congresswoman Slaughter was well known in our community as a passionate trailblazer for women, she was a respected leader and fighter who worked tirelessly for her community in her many years of service. Her colleagues, friends, and family admired her ferocity, advocacy, and compassion for others. Congresswoman Slaughter was frequently recognized for her support of museums and the arts. She is also recognized for her hard work in the planning and construction of the Rochester Amtrak station in the city of Rochester. And whereas Louise was pre predeceased by her husband of 57 years, Robert Bob Slaughter Jr., she is survived by her three daughters, Megan, Amy, and Emily, seven grandchildren, and one great grandchild. She will be missed by all who knew and admired her. Be it further resolved that the clerk of the legislature is hereby requested to forward a copy of this resolution to the bereaved family. This resolution was adopted unanimously with each legislator rising in his or her place for a moment of silence. Your copy of the Journal of Day 4, March 13th, 2018 is available on your tablet. Without exception, the journal will stand approved as submitted. There's a hearing loop in place tonight to assist those who are hearing impaired. Anyone requiring assistance should inquire in the clerk's office. If you have a cellular phone, pager, or other electronic devices in your possession, I would request that you make it inaudible for the duration of the meeting. Thank you for your cooperation. Legislators, the referrals submitted to the legislature for the next committee cycle are available on your tablet as well as online. This evening there are several proclamations scheduled. Madam Clerk. Would Felix Ortiz please come forward? Also President Dr. Joe Carbone, Legislator Frank Alcoffer, and Legislator Tony Michike.
Whereas a role model is one whose behavior, example, or success can be emulated by others. Monroe County is fortunate to be home to so many outstanding role models that have helped guide our community in the right direction. Felix Ortiz, CEO and founder of the Rock City Ravens, exemplifies exactly what it means to be a successful leader and role model. And whereas Felix was born and raised in Monroe County and has devoted his life to improving the lives of inner city youth. In addition to his great extent of volunteer work with various local organizations, Felix started the Rock City Ravens basketball program in order to empower the community's youth and teach life skills through basketball. Felix is a strong advocate for mentoring the players by teaching them teamwork, good decision making, accountability, and respect. Felix also requires the players to volunteer in the community and serve as positive role models for all inner city youth. It is for this reason that Felix is an outstanding role model, not only for his athletes, but also his peers in the Rochester community. And whereas Felix Ortiz is a role model by all definitions in the, of the term, his voluntary service for our community and for inner city youth speaks for itself through his active and rigorous involvement. Monroe County is truly honored to be home to such a respectable and selfless individual. Now therefore, we, Dr. Joe Carbone, President, Frank X. Alcoffer, Legislator District 4, and Tony Michike, Legislator District 26, on behalf of the entire Monroe County Legislature, do hereby recognize and congratulate Felix Ortiz for his commitment to improving the lives of inner city youth through the Rock City Ravens basketball program. This is not what I do. I usually don't like being recognized for what we should be doing anyway. Uh, but I just want to thank Frank Alcofer uh, for taking the time out and you know taking interest in the Rock City Ravens. Um, I want to take, thank all of you, uh, Monroe County Legislator, because you know what? We all come from a different place, but we're all here for the same reason. You know, and we're civil servants. And if we don't do that, guess what? We failed our people. So I just want to have everyone stand up. Uh, Sean Molina, that's my nephew, who's also a firefighter. Ron Jacquet. Ron Jacquet is a young man that I mentor uh, many years ago who's now uh, coaching the Rock City Ravens. So he's giving back. That's. Robert McCullough, also known as Minister McCullough, but family, we call him Peanut. <laughs> uh, Eric Lebrain, he's a student over at Virtus Charter School. He's uh, a part of my program. Dorian Brundage, another young man that I mentor. Um, and I want to acknowledge um, He's the one, remember the, uh, uh, one of these uh, things does not like the other, but he really is, uh, Don Lennox. He's uh, my uh, chair, he's the chairperson for, what is it, Family FOS, for the uh, Boy Scouts of America, because that's what I also do, that's my day job. I'm the uh, executive for the uh, Urban Traditional Program for the uh, uh, Boy Scouts of America, so I do that as well. Um, I just want to say thank you um, for the opportunity. I would like to stick around, but I have to be over at Edison Tech because my guys have a scrimmage over there. Uh, so I got some students waiting for me over there. But I appreciate everything. Thank you. Would Thomas Gillette please come forward? Also, President Dr. Joe Carbone and Legislator Justin Wilcox. Whereas it is the sense of this legislature to honor individuals whose efforts add to the quality of life and the betterment of others across Monroe County. And whereas attendant to such concern and in full accord with long-standing tradition, these legislators are justly proud to honor Thomas D. Gillette. And whereas Tom was born and raised in Ohio, where he received his bachelor's degree in English from Ohio University in 1968. 
Beginning his teaching career in Rochester the following year, Tom taught English in the Rochester City School District for 33 years before his retirement in 2002. During that time, he coached soccer and volleyball, started the Career in Teaching Mentoring Program, and was named Teacher of the Year in 1983. And whereas, Tom joined the New York State United Teachers Union as the staff director to continue to support teachers and improve education in our community. In that role, he helped create the Rochester Area School Health Plan Consortium for Monroe County Schools, assisted thousands of union members by answering questions and providing representation at their workplaces. And whereas, Tom has served on various boards, committees, and coalitions over the years, supporting causes including the United Way, Habitat for Humanity, and Breast Cancer Research. This second retirement will afford Tom more time to fish, spend summers at the lake in Michigan, perfect his already uncanny Karnak the Magnificent impression, and most importantly, have more time with his wife Kim, his children, Tom, Dylan, Maury, and Rory, and his many grandchildren. Now therefore, let it be known that we, Joe Carbone President and Justin Wilcox, Legislator District 14, do hereby honor Thomas D. Gillette upon his retirement on this 10th day of April, 2018. And I even get to make some comments. Uh, I've been active in the community as the proclamation states for many years and have had the opportunity to, uh, I'm trying to recall if I ever spoke to the legislature before. I have a feeling I did, but I can't remember what the issue was. But it's nice to be back and uh, I'm very appreciative of this. Um, one of the things as my age has advanced that I've kind of picked up on is when you're speaking, it's better if you don't make too many points because the people who are listening to you may be more likely to remember the points that you make. So I usually aim for three to five, and more and more I only aim for three. Now this has, this has some additional advantage for me, of course, because it's a lot easier for me to remember three than if I gave you the Letterman top ten, I'd probably get up to around seven and say, and there were a couple other ones, but I'm going to skip those in the interest of time. Uh, also, I'm, as a former English teacher, very likely to draw on characters in literature and poets for uh, public speaking occasions because a lot of people say things a lot better than I can think to say them, certainly while I'm on my feet here. There's a, a character in uh, some mystery novels that uh, Louise Penny writes, who has also distilled his self-guidance to three things that I'll share with you. Three things that he says in a variety of situations and at least one of the three is very appropriate for this evening. This particular character often says to somebody he's interacting with in the course of the narrative, I may be wrong. I think too often a lot of us are reluctant to say that. We'd probably be a better community, I, not that we'd be wrong a lot, but if we would at least acknowledge that maybe somebody else has a good answer too. Second thing he, this character often says is, I need your help. There are a lot of people in our community, we're blessed, who are willing to step up and are stepping up every day. Felix is a good example. And there are hundreds, thousands more, and that's what makes Rochester and Monroe County such a terrific place to live. Third thing that this character frequently says in his interactions, and I'll close with it, he says, thank you. I'm grateful for, for this proclamation, but I'm even more grateful for the friends and associates that 
I've made over the years and uh, to live in a community like Rochester, to live in Monroe County, and uh, thank you. Thank you. There are no formal committee reports scheduled for this evening. We will now hold a public forum. We have several registered to address the legislature. We have a lot of speakers tonight. Please be respectful of the two-minute time limit. Madam Clerk. If you require assistance, a deputy is available to assist you in approaching the lectern. I will call three people forward at one time. Each speaker will have two minutes in which to address the legislature and kindly conclude your remarks when the timer sounds and exit through the back of the chambers. Thank you for your cooperation. Our first three speakers will be Bill Hampson, Arthur Doughton, and Amy Edwards. Legislators, uh, dignitaries, Cheryl, and guests. I gotta talk fast. In speaking to the members from the Sheriff's Department losing their health care, I have to say this, how does this happen? In Monroe County Sheriff's Department, to people who have an ironclad contract stating health care for life and for spouses also. Then our county downgrades our benefits after we retire before canceling our plan altogether after we turn 65, in my case, 71. The county has high-priced attorneys like Harris Beach, Wilcox, just in case we object to going bankrupt in our old age due to losing our health care and thus losing our dignity. The county just doesn't seem to really care at all. There's no mention in our contract of age 65 or Medicare. It's written so a normal, sane person can understand it without an attorney to interpret it. The county didn't... Uh, cancel its way more expensive blue million plan on our same age bracket, we can only speculate that our numbers, 1,802 of us, were greater and created a greater savings. Thus, we were sacrificed. It's anybody's guess. Ours was canceled not only because we were retired and already fulfilled our obligation to the county, but were uh, retired on a fixed income and don't have the wherewithal to properly fund a fight for this injustice. The legislature approved all of our contracts after the agreements were reached, but as of yet, have taken no action to set things right, as of yet. It's no wonder our citizens don't identify with politicians and tend to vote and elect candidates who are not politicians, but are skilled in business, economics, and law. The members of this department will certainly remember anyone who helps our endeavor and also those who abandon us. Our working members are watching this closely and right now expect to get screwed when they become most vulnerable, like us. Not only will those of us who lost our coverage, but the entire department's members and family will court any attorney and or benefactor who will help us just to keep what was taken away unlawfully and will vote accordingly. We want nothing more than what we had, no embellishments. It's ironic that you spend your entire life as a police officer helping others get justice. Then something very val valuable is stolen from you, and there's no one to help you as you did for others. Thank you all for listening, but we need more than just listeners. We need the justice that we perform for others. Thank you very much.
Sorry, I never did this before. Um, good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Amy Edwards and I am the president of the board for Dimitri House. Dimitri House is a local independent charity in downtown New York, in downtown Rochester. And I'm betting that a fair number of you do not know who we are. Or you may think that we are a mission program from a church. Or you may think that we are just a homeless shelter. Dimitri House is 30 years old. We are an independent 5013C. We are not faith-based, although many of our volunteers uh, come to us based on their faith and what drives them. Um, we only have two employees. We have about 80 volunteers. We run our entire operation on less than $170,000 a year, which I can tell you we scrape, beg, and borrow to get. Currently, we feed approximately 3,000 individuals a year, including about 1,000 children and about 250 seniors over the age of 60 out of our food cupboard. Our food cupboard runs 12 months of the year. We have a drop-in lunch program three days a week where we serve 20 to 40 to 60 people. Last year, about 4,500 people ate at our program. We run an emergency men's winter shelter that provides a total of 1,165 beds in the winter to folks needing shelter and a little bit of dignity and a little bit of appreciation. We also provide something called the Dimitri Safe Housing. We provide security deposits to help those get off of the street and into long-term independent living of their own. To date, we have placed almost 90 individuals. We have a 65 plus percent rate of them staying in their apartments and we continue to work with them with case management, with uh, services that they need to help them. Last year, we provided Thanksgiving baskets to 100 and 90 families just in the zip codes that we serve. I tell you all of this so that when you think, when you think what it is to be a charity in Rochester, you think of Dimitri House. When someone says to you, I want to volunteer somewhere, you think, I know where that is. When you think, I want to get more involved, I want to be on a board, please call us. We need you. Thank you very much. Our next three speakers are Mike Hogan, Robert Kehoe, and Christopher McCullough. Mr. Nolfo, Judge Van Stradek, Mr. Napier, President Carbone, honorable members of the legislature. I'd like to read to you a brief excerpt from an article written by reporter Megan McDermott that appeared in this past Sunday's Democrat and Chronicle. The bloody violence of crime scenes and car crashes doesn't leave lingering trauma only with surviving victims and bystanders. These horrors also directly impact first responders, including police, EMTs and firefighters who are direct witnesses to some of humanity's most unimaginable brutality and its aftermath. Numerous studies show that the stress of police work leaves officers more prone to post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and even suicide. Two times this week, Rochester area law enforcement officers were faced with terrible critical incidents. We had the situation, of course, in the town of Greece, where a police officer was forced to use deadly force to contain a gentleman who was pointing a weapon at him. And then we had the horrific homicide of the seven-year-old little boy in the town of Sweden who was decapitated, allegedly, by his own mother. During a press conference on Thursday after that uh, incident, Sheriff Baxter choked up when he related the little boy's injuries. He was quoted as saying this was one of the most horrific scenes you could possibly see. And he praised his deputies for their skill and professionalism during their response 
since that deranged woman was still wielding the knife when the deputies arrived. Most police officers go into law enforcement because they have a love of their community. They are highly emotional people to begin with, and the public doesn't understand the amount of stress they are under. Many scientific studies have proven that exposure to job stress and emotional trauma are significant factors in the development of a host of physical ailments and diseases, resulting in a lower life expectancy for police officers. I'm going to skip a lot of this because of the time constraints. I will tell you there was a study done in 2013, just five years ago, at the University of Buffalo that was published in a very prominent uh, scientific journal that showed that the life expectancy of police officers in western New York was 22 years lower than the national average. These are the same people who have now had their promised health care benefits stripped by this administration at a time in their lives when they are most needed. This action is not only unethical, it is immoral. And the least that this administration can do is to honor the promises that were made. And the least that this legislature can do is to make sure that happens without further delay. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Christopher McCullough, and I'm a resident in North Chile, New York. I am, I am a father, a grandfather, and a friend of many. I am here as the policy director for Recovery Now New York, who has partnered with Gates to Recovery to combat the heroin and opiate epidemic that plagues our community, our city, and our nation. I'd like to thank Legislator Michike for inviting me to speak this evening. In respect to the heroin and opiate epidemic that plagues our nation, I would like to start off by saying I am disappointed that UR Medicine and Rochester Regional Health declined to act on the suggestion to open detox beds from Oasis. This leads me to suggest why are we letting Rochester Regional Health and UR Medicine hold our community hostage in regards to detox beds. We, as in Monroe County, own a hospital. It's called Monroe Community Hospital. This hospital has 555 beds, which some could be made available for detox. I want to thank all those for their efforts so far in combating this epidemic and this plague that has overtaken our community. This is the worst epidemic that has plagued our community, and it's a public health crisis that I've ever seen. One more death is too many. Thank you. Dr. Carbone, members of the leg legislature, thank you for letting me speak tonight. Um, I had some prepared remarks that I decided I wasn't going to deliver tonight, so I just, I just wrote this off the cuff. Um, my name is Mike Hogan. I'm a lifelong resident of Monroe County. I attended uh, Aquinas Institute and graduated there in 1985. Uh, I'm a Navy veteran. I'm a United States Army veteran. I joined the uh, Sheriff's Department in 1991. I've worked, uh, I started in the jail. I've worked every location in the jail that there is. Uh, I then went to the road patrol, and I was a patrol officer for, in, in every uh, zone that there was. I, um, I had the pleasure of serving many different capacities in the Sheriff's Department. I served for three years in the Granite Task Force as an undercover narcotics officer. I uh, 
am a plank owner. In other words, I'm one of the original members of the MCAC intelligence unit. Um, I'm a defensive tactics instructor, a general, ta uh, general topics instructor. Uh, it was during teaching a defensive tactics course where I was struck and injured, suffered a catastrophic injury, had six surgeries, I have a neurostimulator implant. I was retired. I was deemed disabled. Because I was deemed disabled, I was put on Medicare. Because I was put on Medicare, the county stripped my health care. I am the only one, I believe, that has had that happen due to an on-the-job injury. I am totally disabled. I am one of the few people in the United States, law enforcement officers, that was granted a benefit by the Department of Justice and the Public Safety Officer Benefit Program. There was only, I think, 24 last year in the whole United States that received that benefit. I got one. How did my county repay me? They sent me a letter and they said, your health care is gone. Thank you. Thank you. I am the face of what you have done. I hope you're proud. I hope you're proud about the one million dollars which you said you saved. I hope you're proud. Thank you. Our next three speakers are Dr. Ashley Dempsey, Yolanda Bautista, and Joel Shapiro. Well, present, my name is Dr. Ashley Dunphy, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I am a pediatric resident physician here in the city of Rochester, and I have used my own hands to wash urine and feces off the legs of a four-year-old girl who was left to run around in a park by herself while her mother did drugs. She was covered in her own excrement because she had no one caring for her and nowhere to use the bathroom. This past year, I called CPS after one of my patients in my office stated she had been beaten by an adult family member who was living with her family and had schizophrenia. This was not the first CPS call for this family. In the course of six months, I spoke to three different CPS workers because this child's initial CPS caseworker had quit and her supervisor had to pick up her caseload until a new person could be hired. This past month, I've been on the toxicology service and I have seen two children less than two years old come in with opioid overdoses in the course of one week because they got into medication that was improperly stored. Both of these children could have died when being put down for a nap or to bed for the night if their ingestion had not been caught. That is a near miss and that is too close. This is not about the opioids for me. This is about well-meaning parents with their own struggles who need extra direction to avoid an unbearable tragedy. These children need more than reassurance or pity. They need CPS workers who have the financial and emotional resources to do their job, who are not overstretched or underpaid. For their sake, I'm asking you to show us the data. Show us whether the $1.7 million for the prevention of child abuse has truly been allocated and how it's being dispersed and used. Tell us why the job posting on the county website for caseworkers is per diem and how that encourages employee retention and reduces turnover. Tell us how many people have been hired and if that has reduced lag times and case logs. Optimally, for this all to work, we all need to partner together to care for these children, and that requires transparency. So please show us the data. Thank you.
Our next three speakers are Pete Novosny, Elaine Johnson, and Dr. David Topa. Hello, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify tonight. My name is Pete Nabosny. I'm here representing the Children's Agenda. I'm testifying tonight about Monroe County's five-year Child and Family Services Plan. Every five years, counties in New York State have to develop a Child and Family Services Plan and submit it to OCFS. While these plans can be burdensome to staff, they also offer, offer an opportunity uh, to engage in strategic planning, identify areas needing improvement, and help communicate a department's priorities to the community it serves. Uh, Menorah County DHS recently completed its plan. It wasn't too widely publicized, but it's, but it's there. And it's been submitted to OCFS. The Children's Agenda had the opportunity to comment on that plan. Um, I have a handout for each of the legislatures uh, that kind of highlights our response to the county's plan. Um, but there are three main areas I'd like to highlight tonight uh, that we think are relevant. Uh, first, just to reiterate what the last speaker said, um, we really we encourage the county to be more transparent with the community about human services operations, uh, to regularly engage the community, different stakeholders, parents, providers, advocates, uh, physicians, other community members who care deeply about what the county is up to and the goals that the county is trying to achieve. Um, and uh, this includes greater transparency about the eight point uh, improvement plan and, and just sharing sort of the, the data behind um, the county's operations with. CPS in particular, but all sorts of different aspects of county operations. Second, we're encouraging the county to take specific steps afforded to it by New York State to increase access to and the affordability of child care subsidies for families receiving assistance. These steps don't involve additional county dollars, um, but instead help some, address some of the things that people talk about in terms of confusing eligibility and access to uh, child care assistance and things like the benefits cliff that people are often talking about in this community. Uh, finally, we just wanted to make you aware the federal government in January, as part of a bipartisan budget deal, uh, passed the Family First Prevention Services Act. Uh, this will, over the course of the next several years, uh, transform federal spending on child welfare programs in states and therefore counties. Uh, this law could result in the recruitment and retention of more high quality foster homes, better preventive services, richer services for families or it could result in significantly higher costs to the county if we maintain our current level of residential care. Uh, it's essential that the county, in partnership with community stakeholders, begin planning for the implementation of this law immediately. Thank you. Mr. President and members of the legislature, my name is <clears throat> Elaine Johnson. I'm um, from Pittsburgh. I'm a mother and a grandmother and would like to speak to you this evening about the necessity for safe storage of guns in our homes. You're probably aware that two-thirds of gun violence is related to accidents or suicide, mostly in the home. Much of this occurs when a child or teen gets a hold of a loaded firearm left unlocked or improperly stored by an adult. A leading cause of teen death is suicide, the majority committed by a gun. Many such deaths could be avoided by adult owners' locked storage of those guns. At least once a week in America, a child accesses a firearm and shoots him or herself or another person. A recent review of news reports in the U.S showed there were at least 269 instances of a child taking an unlocked gun to school in one year. In addition, over half the guns used in crimes are stolen or taken when they were unlocked or properly stored. It is past time that our county has a safe storage law in place. To that end, 52 members of my church, Downtown United Presbyterian, signed a petition in support of a state safe storage act. It's 
two years old because we've been waiting for the right opportunity to do this and it seems that this is the time, so I will leave that with you. Thank you. Good, after, or good evening. Uh, my name is David Topa. I'm a pediatrician in private practice in the village of Pittsburgh. Um, I've been up here before advocating for CPS uh, strengthening and other uh, preventive services to help prevent child abuse. Um, I happen to believe we can always do better, and here in Monroe County, we're going to do just that. Those were the words of our own county executive, Cheryl Denofel, when she unveiled her eight-point plan back in November uh, for improving CPS services, tightening that safety net for the most vulnerable of our community. Uh, the plan included, amongst other things, funding for 30 new CPS caseworker positions, uh, upgrading the CPS caseworker salary schedule, assigning a recruitment coordinator, uh, development of a uh, public marketing campaign to improve recruitment and retention. And then a month later, she, uh, to the joy of our community in the field of pediatric advocacy, announced a uh, $1.7 million increase in funding for preventive services. And uh, shortly thereafter, I stood up here and said, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I look forward to working together with the county to see what we can do for the most vulnerable of our community. And um, it's been about five months now, and so I think we uh, really need to take a look and see how things are going. So um, in my practice as a physician, I come up with treatment plans all the time. I'd say this eight-point plan is a treatment plan. And the only way we know if the treatment plan is working is we get follow-up tests, x-rays, um, evaluations to always keep in mind or continually see if we're going in the right direction. As a small business owner, I'm well aware of quality improvement plans as well. Many of you might know the Plan Do Study Act acronym, PDSA, where if you want to achieve improvement in your own business, you have to constantly you make the changes, but you reevaluate along the way, and that requires good data. And so now as we're coming up about the six-month mark since the uh, budget passing. We want to share, we want to be part of analyzing the data, but we do need that data. We need to hold ourselves accountable, hold the county administration accountable, and um, we need numbers. We need to know, okay, have those 30 new caseworker positions been hired? If so, what vacancies still remain? What are current caseloads? Also, have improvements been made to the salary schedule? And also, has the $1.7 million been properly allocated? We look forward to getting this report card. If we are moving well towards meeting those goals, great. We'll stand up and celebrate right next, uh, right next to you. However, if not, we need to stand up like adults and say, okay, what can we do better? But in order to figure that out, we need the data. So please share the data with us, and we're more than happy to work with you. Thank you. Well, listening to him, um, please forgive me. I, I don't mean to sound sarcastic, and I, I'm, I'm, I am at an advantage. I can't see well, so I can't see you all. Um, but, you know, I, I'm talking about the people in the city, about the children that, and I'm here because of the children that are being abused. And when I say abused, I don't mean being pinched. I mean children that right now are, are being prepped. They start being prepped at six, seven months old in order so they can receive a penis at a year old. They're being prepped to know how to give oral sex. A lot of the child protective persons, personnel that go in and in, in investigate these things, they're not prepared for this. I had uh, a child protective service person that was leaving a message to a person that I accused, and she sounded like she was making a lunch uh, date with her. This is real. I mean, child protective services nowadays, um, this is, I don't know what they used to investigate way back in the day, but right now this is hardcore. People for, to get their drugs, they're no longer stealing your TV, 
your microwave, they can get that in the garbage. Not even the phone or a computer. They found something better. They found children. They found pedophiles. They're willing to pay a lot of money. There are children orgies. And here we, we talk about some of the things you all talk about. And I can remember hearing a baby being prepped. And I'm thinking, what's going on? The baby's screaming and being hurt, really, really hurt. And the courts don't help because people like myself, we don't get because we're not good at, well, you know what? From all the research that I've done, even if I had been better read, better educated, I still wouldn't want nothing in the court. I was looking at my transcript. And I, and I saw where, where the judge says, all right, I need a motion to dismiss from anybody in writing. And I'm thinking, that doesn't sound good. And it doesn't. Because I'm fighting for little kids, not for me. My life is over. The child that I was fighting for, it's over for him. But if I can do something, if somebody here can really have some compassion and say, let's do something to save those little kids, it doesn't matter what color they are. Brooke Stagels, she got beat up horribly. And there are other kids that get beat up like that. And their kids now, they're not even registered. They got breeders out there. And this is Rochester, New York. This is 2018. Our last speakers are Michael Berger, Lexi Popovich, Arthur Doughton, and Joel Shapiro. Good evening, I'm Michael Berger. I'm a lawyer in Pittsburgh, New York. I came here tonight because I'm a fiduciary relationships lawyer. A lot of my practice deals with hearing fact patterns and advising and protecting fiduciaries, executors, trustees, public officials, partners, to make sure that they're not accused of a breach of fiduciary duty, that they're accountable. I hear fact patterns all the time that instantly raise a concern, but there's always an answer on how to address them. And so when I heard that there were five open items on the CPS budget, some of which you've heard of before and shall read off, it sounded like the exact type of thing I would get called about regularly. Um, lack of information about the current CPS worker caseload. Lack of information about the number of CPS caseworker vacancies. Lack of information about whether there has been um, an additional 30 CPS case workers added. The rate of referrals to CPS. And most troublingly, from the standpoint of my practice, the location of $1.7 million in public funds. The, the answer is easy, provide the information. But failing to act and provide the information creates its own hazard. If this report is inaccurate, if the, if the information is known already, then please point us to where the information is. But if the information is not known, then it reminds me of a quote from one of our most respected jurists, Judge Benjamin Cardozo, who said that fiduciaries, including public officials, must observe the punctilio of honor the most sensitive. Our fate is in your hands. And from an open government standpoint, we're also exposed to a lawsuit 
under the Freedom of Information Law, and the Democrat and Chronicle have, has brought those before. We don't need to spend public funds on attorney's fees. Thank you for listening. Good evening. I want to thank you guys for allowing me to speak tonight. New York State has introduced two bills regarding Tobacco 21. January 5th, 2017, the State Assembly Bill for Tobacco 21 was introduced, and on January 31st, 2017, the Senate Bill for Tobacco 21 was introduced. Fifteen months later, we are still waiting. Although many of our local policymakers are striving to wait for the State Tobacco 21 law to pass, we find it imperative now more than ever to coordinate efforts for a local scale effort. When I say we, I am referring to the majority of Monroe County. On a daily basis, I interact with and have discussions with local health organizations, community-based organizations, doctors, college campus deans, academic researchers, school administrators and counselors, substance abuse prevention agencies, police departments, town supervisors and village mayors, PTAs, community citizens, and youth. All these groups unanimously agree Tobacco 21 is necessary in our county and often ask why are we waiting for the state? Why not right now in our county? As the collection of signatures circulates the county, there are three things to note. Cigarette sales to those under 21 years old accounts for 2.12% of total tobacco sales. Locally, a Tobacco 21 policy would cost the county roughly a total of $226,000 annually between all 623 tobacco retailers with more long-term cost savings in millions. Secondly, nicotine's impact on a teenager's brain and behavior makes them more susceptible to experience a pathway towards a substance abuse disorder with alcohol and other substances. With a local opioid action plan, we see Tobacco 21 as a useful policy, a useful prevention policy for our youth. As most studies show illicit drug users do use tobacco, and smokers are two times more likely than non-smokers to relapse after battling drug addiction. Thirdly, local principals and school health counselors urge policies that help increase the awareness of e-cigarette dangers, nicotine addiction, and the prevention of e-cigarette access to middle and high schoolers who have become frequent users, dual users, and often marijuana e-juice users while vaping. Overall, our, com our community, our home, and our citizens want to become the 20th locality in New York to pass this policy. Thank you. This concludes the public forum. At this time, we'll recess the April 10th, 2018 meeting of the Monroe County Legislature and convene the Pure Waters Administrative Board for the gates Chile ogden seward District. PWAB agenda item number one, referral 18-0106. Moved by Legislator Brew, seconded by Legislator Delahanty. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item carries. Next item. No, now we will recess the gates Chile ogden sewer District and adjourn, adjourn the Pure Waters Administrative Board. The April 10th, 2018 meeting of the legislature is reconvened. We will now proceed with the consideration of motions, resolutions, and notices. Will the clerk read the next item on the agenda? Item number one, referral 18-0092. Oh, Second, Mr. President. Moved by Legislator DeFlorio, seconded by Legislator Boyce. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number... Pardon? Roll call vote. Thank you, Legislator Lightfoot. I didn't know that. Thanks. <laughs> Roll call vote, please. Mr. Marinetti? Yes. Mr. Al Ms. Kaylee is excused. Mr. Alcoffer? Yes. Mr. Ancello? Yes. Mr. Baroth? Yes. Ms. Boyce? Yes. Mr. Brew? Yes. Mrs. Conley is excused. Mr. Delahanty? Yes. Mrs. DeFlorio? Yes. Mrs. Draw? Yes. Mr. Felder? Mr. Flagler Mitchell? Yes. Ms. Harris? Yes. Mr. Hebert? Yes. Mr. Howland? Yes. Mr. Lightfoot? Yes. Mr. Mafucci? Yes. Mr. Michike? Yes. Mr. Morelli? Yes. 
Mr. Moyo? Yes. Mr. Rocco? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Ms. Ms. Taylor? Yes. Mr. Turp? Yes. Mr. Wilcox? Mr. Wilt? Yes. Mr. Zale? Yes. President Carbone? Yes. 25 to 1 motion passes. Next item, please. Item number two, referral 18-0093. Move it, Mr. President. Second, Mr. President. Moved by Legislator Turp, seconded by Legislator Elkoffer. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing, seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number three, referral 18-0100. Move it, Mr. President. Second. Moved by Legislator Boyce, seconded by Legislator Delahanty. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number four, referral 18-0101. Move it, Mr. President. Moved by Legislator Boyce, seconded by Legislator Delahanty. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number five, referral 18 0102. Second. Moved by Legislator Boyce, seconded by Legislator Delahanty. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number six, referral 18 0103. Moved by, Mr. President. Moved by, Second, Mr. President. Moved by Legislator Mitchell Case, seconded by Legislators Boyce and Delahanty. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number seven, referral 18 0104. Moved by Legislator Brew, seconded by Legislator Delahanty. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number 18-0105. Moved by Legislator Brew, seconded by Legislator Delahanty. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number nine, referral 18-0107. Second. Moved by Legislator Howland, seconded by Legislator Delahanty. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number 10, referral 18-0108. Move it, Mr. President. Second. Moved by Legislator Zale, seconded by Legislator Delahanty. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number 11, referral 18 0109. Moved by Legislator Zale, seconded by Legislator Delahanty. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number 12, referral 18 0110. Move it, Mr. President. Moved by Legislator Delahanty, seconded by Legislator Hebert. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number 13, referral 18-0111. Move it, Mr. President. Moved by Legislator Delahanty, seconded by Legislator Hebert. This is also to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number 14, referral 18-0112. Move it, Mr. President. Moved by Legislator Delahanty, seconded by Legislator Hebert. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number 15, referral 18-0113. Moved by Legislator Howland, seconded by Legislator Delahanty. This is to adopt. Second. Also seconded by Legislator Lightfoot. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Item carries. Next item. On this item here, I'd like to request that Vice President Draw come forward and preside over the vote for the next item. 
I have provided medical services to the plaintiff in this case and request the vice president draw, excuse me, for the vote on this item and authorize me to exit the chamber. So, Legislator uh, Carbone, President Carbone, you are excused from voting on this next item, and I authorize you to exit the chambers. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Item number 16, referral 18-0114. Move it, Madam President. Moved by Legislator Delahanty and seconded by Legislator Hebert. Uh, this is to adopt. Is there any discussion on this? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Item carries. At this time, I would like to request the President Carbone assume the chair and preside over the re remainder of the meeting. Maybe. Or maybe I'll just stay. No. And the next item. Item number 17, referral 18 0115. Second. Moved by Legislator Boyce, seconded by Legislator Delahanty. This is also to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number 18, referral 18 0116. Moved by President, second. Legislator Brew, seconded by Legislator Delahanty. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? None. All in favor say aye. Aye. Next item. Item number 19, referral 18 0117. Moved by Legislator Bruce, seconded by Legislator Delahanty. This is to adopt. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number 20, referral 18 0118. Second. Second. Moved by Legislator Mitchiki, seconded by Legislators Brew and Delahanty. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Next item. Item number 21, referral 18 0119. Moved by Legislator Holland, seconded by Legislator Delahanty. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item carries, next item. Item number 22, referral 18-0019-BR. Moved by Legislator Holland, seconded by Legislator Delahanty and Legislator Lightfoot. This is to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item carries, next item. Item number 23, referral 18-0120. Second. Second. Moved by Legislator Holland, seconded by Legislator Delahanty and Legislator Lightfoot. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Item number 25, referral 18 0122. Second. Moved by Legislator Boyce, seconded by Legislator Delahanty and Legislator Lightfoot. This is to adopt, and before discussion, can the administration give us a brief description of why this is a matter of urgency? Uh, through you, Mr. President, it would be my pleasure. In the past, we've brought these matters of settled contracts with, uh, where we've had uh, agreements with our unions to, the, to this body in an expeditious fashion, and by, uh, by passing this tonight will allow us to have the raise reflected in Friday's paycheck. Hey, thank you. Is there any further discussion on this? Legislator Lightfoot. Thank you for recognizing me, Mr. President. I'd just like to uh, thank our deputies uh, for working uh, so long without a contract and for keeping their uh, professionalism um, towards us in, in our chambers and in our um, courtrooms. Um, I didn't know for so long they worked without a raise. Uh, as I walked through there, they treated me with courtesy, and I felt safe. So I want to thank them for um, all their hard work. 
um, throughout these trying times. Thank you. Thank you, Legislator Lightfoot. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Item carries. There being no unfinished business, Legislator Marionetti. Thank you, Mr. President, we stand adjourned until 6 p.m. Tuesday, May 8th, 2018.